Hello everybody, welcome back to the show. Today I'm very happy to talk to you about one of my favorite firearms of all time, the SIG P226. I finally was able to get my hands on one, and I'm going, and the, the focus of today's episode is we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of, of SIG Sauer and why this was such a big deal. And we're gonna talk about why it was a big development in the military history. So, with that said, stick around. Looking forward to it. Oh, good, you stayed, cool. So, today we got it. We cannot talk about the SIG 226 without talking about the history of SIG Sauer. So from all my research, the SIG, uh, what we now consider SIG Sauer has been around for almost a hundred years. Um, the original SIG factory w was in Switzerland and founded by, I'm gonna butcher this, uh, Eimhofen, Frederick Petro Eimhoff. I think that's pretty well, and Heinrich Moser. Not Mauser, Moser. And they started building their firearms in 1953. That is one of the origins. It was, it, the place was called the Swiss Wagon Factory. And then you jump forward and um, in, in 1864 is when we see the SIG, uh, SIG actually first named, uh, the Swiss Industrial Company. Um, there was another company called Sauer that was a German company during the after that there was a er, and before it became Sig Sauer they produced what we what is very popular firearm called the Sig 210 now that all that was was really a I'm gonna oversimplify this but it's pretty um, it's pretty self-explanatory all it was was a Swiss version of the Browning high power and actually the Browning high power in this in to this day still shares very similar characteristics with this firearm. Wish I had one I could show off, but I don't. So, um, there's your brief little history of Sig Sauer and how this came to be, but that wasn't this gun's forefather. In 1975, when Sig Sauer finally um, it, it introduced into the world the Sig 220 series. Now, uh, the Sig 220 we all still, um, some people still buy it. It's there. It is the 45 caliber version of the Sig P220 series nowadays, and um, I do believe they make a 10 millimeter version of it nowadays. But when it first came out, it was a direct copy of the Browning Double Action, which was the updated version of the Browning High Power, and it shot a 45 caliber. Uh, it shot 45 ACP, and it was chamber, and it had a eight round magazine, and it had a uh, it pretty much visually looks identical to what the modern SIG looks like, but with some exceptions, and we'll talk about the exceptions as we go through. So after its initial success with that farm in the mid 70s, in the mid, mid they already started their, um, their ideas of modernizing it because the, uh, the Browning Double Action or the SIG 220 at the time can, did have, um, it wasn't caliber specific at the time. They came out in nine millimeter, 45, and I do believe they made a uh, early 40 caliber version. I'll have to do more research on that when I get my hands on that specific firearm, but that's, a, that's for a later video. As stated earlier, this video is specifically on the P226 and its long history of variants. So let's get into that. The one I the, the the one we have today is the 226R DAK variant. It is um, as you notice, it does not have the access to the hammer, which is a purposeful design, which we'll get into later. But the um, it also features a rail. That's what the P226R stands for. It's got it's it's got the railed version. It and from what I can figure out, I've ha I've had this apart and I've cleaned it. This is this was manufactured in 2004, so a little a very uh, older model, but you can tell it real the design really has not changed all that much over the period of time. 
Um, you notice it does not have a decocker, but that goes back to the re for the, the double action only system. So, okay. Gun came out in 1985. When it first came out, it was available in four major calibers. Nine millimeter, 40 cal, 357 SIG, which we'll get into that in a minute, and uh, 22 long rifle, as always. Everybody likes the 22 long rifle. It's great to take to the Plinkin range. It's, it's a fun little system, but it allows people to get familiar with this. Um, and since then, there's been other variants of this gun taken out. And this is why this, um, this gun is the king of the 90s, okay? Obviously, it was introduced in, um, it was introduced in 1985 and immediately well received across the world. German government picked it up. Swiss government obviously picked it up. Um, every major counterintelligence agency has used the 226 in some way, shape, or form. And to this day, the United States Mil uh, Navy SEALs still prefer this platform over all the modern platforms. Now, we know the modern joke of this, of SIG Sauer with military contracts. They are now, modern SIG is, um, they've kind of become a laughing stock because anytime they make something, there's already militaries like willing to bid on it and buy it. Like they don't even have to go through the military trials at this point, i.e. the new uh, 762 rifle or 762 variant rifle that they're coming out with um, for the United States military. Way over engineered, way over designed because, and it's, and this, this platform ha is why SIG is the way it is today. It, um, it proved that SIG can make something so reliable and so accurate and relatively cheap. Um, the initial costs for these things are not were not expensive. They were like six hundred bucks, which I mean in modern modern equivalency that's close to eight hundred dollars, which is pretty, which is still fairly. Don't mean to be that guy, but that's still fairly cheap when thinking of a a, a metal framed hammer action revolve or hammer action pistol so what else made it so popular because it when i say it blew up it literally blew up on everything you could not watch a movie in the 90s without any act like if you were a lot like me you grew up watching action films you grew up watching films like the rock um and cis uh red heat uh I can I, the list can I can make this list go on X Files. This gun even uh, the the Sig two two six was also in X Files. Um, it's just one of those iconic. Fi it, it was an instant iconic firearm. It was space age looking. It was cool, but, but that's I can that it was mostly to the success of the Sig two twenty that came out. But it this gun does something to you when you when you hold it. This is just the the grip is. Alt is very comfortable. The action, everything is just almost perfect for this gun. Now, but why was it so popular? What, so it had a lot of initial success because in every video game you, every modern video game has a version of the SIG, of, of the SIG 220 series in it. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful gun and I cannot stress that enough. And this is probably if 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 Sig was to have a magnum opus, a, their greatest work, the Sig 220 is that. If if not that, the Sig 556 five, rifle. That those that that combo. If if you were to drop me off in Africa in the in the mid mid eight, uh, in the in the early nineties, and you were to ask me, hey, what are you going to take with you? If if not my if not something chambered in 762 by 39 like I prefer, I will take the SIG 556 rifle and the 220 version of this gun. Just because they've proven they're battle reliable. And there's a reason why the United States Navy SEALs still use them to this day. It is a proven weapon. Now, now that we've talked a little bit about pop culture, about... Um, the history of the gun, or the history of how it came to be, we do have to look at something before I, I move too further, because something that we have to we have to um, 
take into consideration here is, I mean, obviously, I've said this, I've probably said this now for three or four times, it blew up. It was an instant popular gun. Let's look at what. Over here, show and clear, um, you, this is a Taurus copy of the SIG, or of the Beretta M90, M9, um, Beretta 92, whatever you want to call it. <coughs> And if, if you hold these guns side to side, they are very, very different mechanical systems. So Beretta, um, pretty much, the Beretta design came out in 1975, and it is, I mean, it's a comfortable gun to carry, it's very reliable. But that's not without its issues. So ask any service member that served in, um, I mean, it was great for when you're over here or in a jungle climate, it's loose enough, it's great. But any, if you ask anybody from, let's say 1996, that served in the military from 1996 till the gun was replaced by the SIG to uh, 320, they are not a fan of this gun. They did not like, it jammed a lot, which is weird to me that if you look at the action, the action is incredibly open. Like it, the port literally goes from here, almost right up to where um, the firing pin assembly is to the front sight. It's, in, in my opinion, that, or from what I've experienced, from how I've shot this gun, this is my, Truth be told, this isn't my firearm. This is my father's. This is my brother's. Full disclosure, these are not my guns. But I grew up with. I grew up with this. I, I, my, I myself have probably put a thousand rounds through this gun. Um, I have not shot this yet. Hopefully, we're going to the range over the weekend, so this will be awesome to actually fire it. I, fi I have fired a Sig Sig two two six before, and I fell in love with it immediately. Just a very com comfortable system. Now, this even though this came out in 75, this came out in 85, there are some antiquated designs to the Beretta system. So the Beretta system is almost a carbon copy off of the Walther P38 operating system, which I've done a video on. You can go check that out um, in the links below. The um, It's got the ambidextrous uh, safety. It's got... Uh, the very easy, very simple takedown assembly, but it's still a older design. The barrel does not lift up like most people, like the Browning system does. And some people say that helps with accuracy, that helps with being able to chamber the round easier, which I would agree with considering that some, believe it or not, this gun does stove, uh, stove pipe and hang up. Surpri that was surprising to me when I, re when I was reading through some of the complaints of why the, why this was more popular than this. So, that and another big complaint is the trigger assembly here is open. You pull the, um, you pull the hammer back, pull the firing pin, this is all out in the open, very similar to the P38 that um, we've already looked at. This, on the other hand, the trigger assembly and everything is enclosed. It's inside the gun, and it's I'm not for a YouTube video. Video, I'm not going to do a complete takedown because apparently that's frowned upon. YouTube. Um, it just pretty much t took what was already the high power and modernized it. You can't. John Moses Browning was a genius. He was a god amongst men, and you cannot argue with the, with his mechanics. The Germans and the Italians like to be a little bit more complicated. So, for the rest of this video, this gun will be. Oh, now the Sig two two six is still in service. It's and as I said, I'll get to its. Uh, when I told you I'll get to its sub variants. We're going to get to that now. It was very popular and still is very popular within military within the military community. It is a steel framed double action uh, nine millimeter pistol with with um, fifteen rounds, and 
well, 16 if you chamber one first, depending on how you carry it. The, uh, but this is particularly interesting version. So um, when it first came out, it did not have the rails and it did not, it actually had a, you know, hammer that you can actually touch with your thumb. This is a very special version. This version that I have here was designed and manufactured for law enforcement purposes. I wouldn't say only, but it was designed for law enforcement specifically. It um, it, it might um, some might consider it they handicapped the gun with the with DAK because what it did was the the compared to other triggers. This is a very heavy trigger. This almost feels like a revolver pick trigger. It's about six, six and a half pound pull. And the reset is, if you wanna do this with me, not, not, still on the wall, still on the wall. That, there it goes. And it does not reset until all the way up here. And it does have the, um, You, do, you will see that if you did fire around, it does kind of have a half cock here, which I don't understand the purpose of, especially on a double action only. If you compare that to the SIG 250 that does not have that, um, and is also no hammer. I'm hoping to do a video on the 250 here soon because that's another one of my favorite SIG firearms that they just, for some reason, they, they had a great concealed carry market but I guess the striker fires were the way of the future, so they, they, they axed them, which I still think was a bad idea. All right, I have, I have shot a 250. My uncle's got a 250 that I love. Like, I, if I could buy it off him tomorrow, I would. The, um, but the version of this was made for law enforcement, and it it kind of hinders your shot because if you're not, if you're like me and like everybody in my family, we all train with rapid triggers. Some of some of us have uh, custom triggers that we put in our own firearms. The this revolver feeling trigger is not ideal for fast paced shooting, and some and some speculate that was a purposeful thing was to limit. It it, it kind of forced police officers to limit their shots so to speak it's i went down a deep rabbit hole trying to figure out why on god's green earth they would put this trigger in here now if you're like me and used to shooting revolver it's not too bad you get used to it pretty fast but it's just one it's one more thing that it shouldn't be so that's my only complaint on this firearm other than that it is incredibly simple to clean it's incredibly easy to maintenance and it's incredibly comfortable. So if, but like I said, let's get into the future variants of this. So the, this gun is the king of the 90s, okay? The T, the 226 made its way through all kinds of law enforcement. You saw it on shows like X-Files, JAG, NCIS, early episodes of NCIS. But the ones you saw in NCIS, you would notice they're a little bit different. That's because, um, with the success of this gun, they realized, oh, we need a more carryable version where the barrels are slightly smaller, the grip's slightly smaller, something easier to conceal and stuff. And that was the birth of what we call the 228. Now, I have the ability to get a 228. I just have to ask the right person. I would love to do a breakdown where I have a 228, 226, and a 220 so we can see the further developments of that, of that, of the systems. Because there are minor changes that they did along the way. Like for example, so after the, and the 228 had a lot of success, it was actually picked up by the United States Army and they, the Army CID still used them, but they're now called the M11A1s. Um, to, to boot with that, they took it a, a step further for law enforcement and people like us that like to carry, they developed the 229. Now the 229, I should, uh, let me let me take a step back. The 228 was strictly nine millimeter only, like they only manufactured that in nine millimeter. Whereas this, uh, the SIG 226, they, man they, they manufactured in both 
40 caliber Smith and Wesson, um, nine millimeter and 357 SIG were the most popular. Now, what they did after the two after the success of the 228, the SIG 229 was chambered in nine millimeter. It was chambered in the same. It had all the same options as the SIG 226. Just did not have the um, the, the 20, uh, 22 long rifle, and it was designed to replace the 228 because the um, it was made to be compact, made to be carryable, but it was also available railed. It was available with a DK, DAK trigger. Beautiful. It, it was just. It was equally. It was a. Per, it was a perfect carbon copy of this, where the 228 kind of wasn't, just because it was made for. It was made cheaper. It was the 228 was kind of like that. Oh, we want to make a short carry version, but with this. So, and then what came after that? So you have the subcompact version of the 226, which is the 224, which um, is uh, cha cha mostly chambered in nine millimeter. It's also available in 357 SIG and 40 caliber. It was 12 round magazine, great little subcompact gun. And it was also available in um, double action, single action, or double action only. I don't know if they made it with the DAC trigger, I'll have to do more research on that when I get my hands on one, but that'll be a, something for later. They discontinued making that in 2016 because why, ha why have a subcompact version of something that is already the 229, which is already easily carryable and pretty much accepted through all law enforcement? And the re and this is what we're going to get into: why the 226 itself will never die. Why this is the king of modern firearms. This right here, I will take to my grave, is the king of modern firearms. It is the perfection of the Browning high power. It is the perfection of everything John Moses Browning has put into it. Even though this gun was designed by the Swiss, it was designed by a German Swiss company, obviously Six Hour. But its roots are, like its grandfather, so to speak, is the Browning high power. And it is the most widely accepted law enforcement pistol in the world. It is also stupidly simple. It's mechanically, it is, I mean, you can't argue with it. I know, I, I know I'm going to get some Glock fans in here saying, well, the FBI replaced it with Glock. Or, yeah, the mil some militaries have replaced it with Glock. Some federal agencies have replaced it. I don't care. There's, you cannot, you're not going to be able to convince me that um, a steel framed firearm is not better than a polymer framed pop firearm. And I, I have a hard time trusting striker fires. Call me a boomer, call me a FUD, whatever you want to. I'd rather have a hammer that I can guarantee is going to go off, especially when you're in a veritable climate. Now, I know Grantham did his drop test video and, and I saw that hammer fire guns are more likely to go off if you drop them. That is unfortunate. I don't, the way that he was dropping them, I'm not sure if that was the most correct way because I would have loved to see how some of those striker fires handled falling face down, but, or falling like this instead of like this or like this. Sorry, Grantham. I'm just asking, I'm just posing questions here, you know, scientific questions. But the, uh, Striker fire systems had a hard time in variable climates, which was shocking to me, whereas this thing will go every time. But also, there are some limitations to hammer fire versus striker fire, and I can do a separate video on that later. But all in all, the 226 will never die. It was the, going back to the, let's take one last touch on the pop culture thing, the, if Sully and Mulder from the X-Files were, were willing to trust this gun against facing monsters, aliens, and whatever. That should be good enough for me. I mean, I know it's, po I know it's a movie, but it's whatever. Uh, God, I can't even think of it. It's just become such a movie. I, it's like the go-to movie good guy gun. I know some people are gonna say, oh, we, it's, it's, it's been replaced by the SIG 230 or 320. Um, 
Glock, um, Smith & Wesson MP. I have a Smith & Wesson MP. I carry that thing daily. If I could find a SIG 227, which the 227 is essentially this, double, double, it's a double stack version of the 220. If I could find one of those, I would be more than happy to carry that every day than, what, than the Striker Fire Smith & Wesson. Beautiful firearm all around. Really no, no real complaints against it. Um, and something about the 226 is it's highly um, customizable. You can throw on, um, you can still to this day, um, if you bought a 1985 SIG, you can go to either Smith & Wesson, or not Smith, uh, you can go to SIG Sauer, or you can go to any custom firearm company and buy a new barrel, ported, threaded, whatever. Um, trigger groups, you can buy trigger groups that are pretty much drop-in. I'm using that termly, anybody that has gunsmiths knows that's not, you can't just put a drop-in trigger on a, on a pistol, but they're easily putting, they're easy, uh, they're easy to put in and replace the one that we have. Now, I'm not sure about the double action one. There, I mean, there's a reason why, I don't think they still make it with the, uh, the DAC trigger. And I'm sure there's a reason for that. I can think of a couple off offhand. And I don't know how easy it would be to replace that. Apparently, rumor has it, that's gonna be a project within the family here soon. So just rumor. I'll let you know. I'll keep I'll let you guys know how that goes and how that progresses. But yeah, I overall I have no complaints with this gun and why it'll forever be timeless. We're probably we will probably see a version of this gun when we fight in the first intergalactic war against the aliens when they come, if you believe in that sort of thing. This thing will, this thing is like the buff. This thing will see space in one way, shape or form, whether it's, whether it's uh, our first Space Force SEAL team or um, the Marines finally wise up and switch back to these. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think of the SIG, of the SIG 226. Uh, what do you like about it? What do you hate about it? Do you think the Beretta was better? That's the only, that was the only comparable 9mm I could find when this gun came out. Even, even Smith & Wesson could not make a cheap, decent firearm to, to compete with this in the 80s. And the Beretta was, uh, it's the Beretta. The Beretta is another pop culture icon that deserves its own video when I get one. I might use that one. I don't know. Yet. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, I would love if you would subscribe. Again, I don't care about the clicks or anything like that. I love sharing these stories with you. I love sharing history of firearms. That's my that's my shtick. That's what I'm sticking to. Um, as always, stay strong. Watch your six. Keep your head on the swivel. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.